Now, turn your attention to the keyboard. Have the keyboard on a flat surface. You should now be able to remove any one of the keys. Disassemble the entire keyboard. Now, clean the keyframe with a vacuum cleaner. Now that the keys have been taken out of the key well, it's time to remove the lead. Back when this Z-Box was first made, most harpsichords were played by pianists who preferred heavier action. However, now, most professional harpsichordists, and amateurs for that matter, prefer lighter action, so some of the lead that weighs down the keys needs to be removed. The natural keys of this particular Z-Box have three weights. The sharp keys have two weights. Your Z-Box might not be the same. For example, some Z-Box keyboards have two weights in the naturals and one weight in the accidentals. Adjusting the weight of the Z-Box keys is very case specific. It depends on the keyboard that you have and the preferences of the performer that this instrument is intended for. Usually, to get the right touch, some experimentation will have to be performed. On this particular keyboard, we have found that the best touch is achieved by removing the frontmost two weights on the natural keys and the backmost weight of the accidental. So, this weight, this weight, and this weight have to come out. Removing the weights is a fairly simple procedure. First, find a hole in some sort of table or whatever you're working on and slide the key over it. Then, take a small round metal object, in this case I'm using the head of a tuning hammer, and a hammer, and simply pound the weight out. The same thing goes for the other key. If the keys are still too heavy, drill a small hole through the remaining weight using a hand drill or a drill press. When the weight is removed, it's usually a good idea to go over the key with some sandpaper. This makes the side of the key nice and smooth and it won't rub against the other keys when it's in the key well. Now it's time to adjust the key dip. The key dip is the distance that the key depresses down. Here, it measures about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Ideally, the dip would be between a quarter of an inch and 5 sixteenths of an inch. So, in this case, the dip needs to be increased. To change the dip, first, take out the key And, at the front of the key, there will be some felt and there might be some punchings under it. Take those out. So, 
Here's the felt. And depending on who did the keyboard, there might be some punchings as well. Cardboard punchings like this. To raise the keyboard, or rather to make the key dip less, simply put more punchings under the felt. To make the key dip lower, place less or no punchings under the felt. Once you have modified the number of punchings to give you the appropriate dip, take out all the keys and do the same thing to each of them. The end result of all this should be a keyboard that is both light and uniform to the touch. That means that each key should weigh the same under the fingers. No key should be lighter or heavier than the next. Now it's time to do the jack conversion. We'll need several things. First, the new support for the lower guide. The lower guide itself the register, the register and blocks, and the jack rail filler strip. The first thing you want to do is take the old lower guide support and put it on top of the new one. Center it so that the old support is right on top of the new one. Then, take some sharp object and scratch around the holes in the old support. This marks where the holes should be on the new support. You will now have to drill out these holes using a hand drill or a drill press. An alternative to this is to simply reuse the old support and not use this support at all. What you would have to do in this case is take off this lower guide but leave the support intact. However, I prefer to use the new support. Now that the holes are drilled, it's time to glue the lower guide to its support. Apply an even coat of glue to both the support and the lower guide. After the glue is applied, let it dry for a couple of seconds. After waiting a few seconds, join the two together. It's best to secure these two pieces with clamps, like these. They will help hold it together.
Now it's time to glue the register end blocks to the register. Take the register and turn it upside down. Apply glue to the end blocks and the register ends. Put the block at the end of the register. Make sure that the block does not cover this last jack slot. Do the same thing for both ends. Always remember to clean off any extra glue. It's now time to put the lower guide back into the instrument. Don't screw the lower guide in too tightly. Odds are, you're going to have to adjust it later. It's now time to make the final adjustment for the lower guide. First, slide the keyboard back into place. Screw two of the screws that keep the keyboard in place back in. That way, the position of the keys are exactly where they would be when the instrument is finished. Place one jack in the slot corresponding with middle C. Check that the slot is center and the jack is directly centered on middle C. Adjust the lower guide until that happens. Take the keyboard back out. Finally, tighten the screws that hold the guide in place. The new register can now be put into the instrument. The new register is longer and narrower than the old register. The screws that keep the register in place therefore need to be adjusted.
These adjustments are rough and will need to be fine-tuned later. To secure the register, hammer the metal bar that we took out back in. The new register should now be directly above the lower guide. Check the distance with a ruler. If the register is not directly above the lower guide, use the ruler to determine which adjustment screws need to be adjusted in order for the register to be directly above the lower guide. 